So the next speaker is Franz Thoma, and he's a software engineer, right? At the TNG Technology Consulting in Munich. And what well, we just saw uh, DSL in the, in the keynote, and he's also talking about DSLs, but maybe more restrictive ones, like applicable factor based things. Okay, well, thank you. Thank you for having me here, and welcome to BobConf. Um, I'm going to talk about applicative DSLs today. So uh, in functional programming, uh, when you design a, an embedded DSL or an external DSL, you usually start with a type. And uh, you, you design some combinators around this type. And usually, this type is, uh, this type is monadic. Because uh, a monad in, uh, in functional programming is kind of a, a way to encode a limited set, a set of, uh, of side effects. And, um, and then you have an interpreter that, uh, that can, uh, um, can inter interpret this, uh, this language and, uh, and translate this limited set of side effects to actual I.O. Or, uh, or even execute it in a, in a pure way. Um, and well, so uh, I'm going to talk first about uh, side effects in general, or monadic and the click effects in general. <coughs> The functor and monad types have been uh, around in Haskell for a very long time. So uh, I, I think uh, at least or more than 20 years. So most, uh, most uh, combinator libraries or DSLs are based on a monad type. And uh, this is also uh, something that's very known to, you know, uh, by now to, to people uh, outside the functional programming community. You have the flat map function, the map function, you know those from from uh, from JavaScript promises, from Java streams. Uh, so a lot of languages have adopt uh, have adopted those types, even if they don't have the actual abstraction. So you don't have a monad abstraction in Java, but you still can uh, define your flat map functions. So those are quite well known by now. Um, the applicatives are a much younger invention. I think they date back to 2008, and they are in the in the hierarchy. They are in between the functor and uh, the monad. Uh, monads are a kind of uh, a way to uh, to sequence computations. So you execute some effectful computation, then you take the result and have a new effectful computation that can depend on that result. While the functor is something is a has only the possibilities to change results without even affecting the, uh, the, the uh, computation itself. So you have a container or computation, and if you map uh, over that, then uh, you, you don't change uh, or touch the effects at all. Um, the applicative is something in between. You have a limited way to, um, to interact with uh, the effects. <coughs> so you can uh, merge effects together, but you can't uh, have conditional effects that depend on previous effects. And that's something we, so usually we want to use the full power of monads because it's already there, it's uh, kind of free to use. Um, but in some cases it's actually uh, better to have a little more restricted DSL that allows some more, uh, some more power uh, on, on the other end. So the, the language is a little less expressive, but it's sometimes more powerful in what you can achieve with this uh, language. So we're going to, to talk about um, the applicatives in general first, and then I'm going to give some examples for DSLs that leverage the power of, uh, of applicatives. Um, the, the applicative type class uh, has two, two methods, pure, which is uh, an effectful computation that doesn't have any side effects. So it's basically a no-op side effect um, that returns still a pure value. And we have lift A2, which allows us to combine two effectful computations um, into one new computation and c combine the results using a function f we're given. So we have a we have a pure function that takes two arguments and we have take two effects and merge the effects together and, uh, the, and the values. Um, compare this to monadic effects, where we have 
the, the bind operator, or in most languages it's actually called flat map, um, where you take an effect and a function that takes the, uh, that operates on the results and gives you back a new effect. So you have a you have an intrinsic dependency between the, uh, the the second effect and the execution of the first effect. You can you can only execute the second effect, the, the MB, if you've previous, previously executed the first one and uh, obtained the result. Uh, the example implementation for the for maybe so maybe is uh, kind of uh, has the effect of aborting computations early. So it's kind kind of like exceptions, uh, just without specifying exactly what type of exception. You're just saying at some point, uh, sorry, I can't give you an, uh, can't give you a result. And so when you when you actually have a result then you can continue with the next computation based on this result. And if you don't have anything, if you don't have a result, well then the only thing you can do is actually return nothing. Um, and then there is no next computation. You just skip all the, <coughs> all the further computations. Applicative effects are based on lift A2. And as you see here, uh, this this function can be applied directly to the to the effects. They can they can um, run independently. In order to compute that value c, you need to run the two effects, but you can run them independently. You you don't need to wait for one computation to uh, to execute the next one. So for this is not the actual implementation for maybe, but that's uh, a valid implementation that you pattern match directly on two effects at the same time or at once and you check whether both are uh, present, whether you have two results and if you do then you can uh, return, you can just uh, apply the function to the result and if, you, if one of the results is missing or even both then well you return nothing. <clears throat> so compare this to to functor, we see so uh, the, the the method of f uh, of, uh, of the functor class, which is f map or map. Um, there you have a unary function that uh, takes one value and uh, and lifts it to a computation that takes a takes a single effect. So we don't need to look at the effect at all. And in fact, the the functor laws. Uh, force us to um, to not look at the effects and just at the values. Lift A2, on the other hand, allows us to to combine effects. So we have a limited way to to look. Well, we don't look at the effects, but uh, the implementation of uh, Lift A2 has actually um, a way to to merge those effects. <clears throat> now, there's a hierarchy between those three uh, three type classes or three concepts. Uh, so, uh, so every monad is also an applicative, and every applicative is also a functor. <clears throat> That's why we can derive uh, the lift A2 directly from uh, from the monadic bind if you have uh, if you already have a monad instance, and you do that by running those two computations sequentially, and then applying the uh, applying the the combine function to to those two results. And in Haskell you can use do notation, that's syntactic sugar for, well, something that's basically desugared to this bind or flat map operator. And here you can see that we actually have to, to do those two computations sequentially. You've, we first have to run the MA, then uh, we obtain the result A, then we run the MB. We could, um, in principle, run this MB without the A. It doesn't depend on it, but uh, the structure of uh, of the bind operator forces us to to first run one and then run the other, even if there is no interdependency. In fact, there are two canonical uh, implementations of lift A2. We could flip the, the first two lines here or above, and it, it wouldn't make any difference for uh, for the laws connecting uh, monad and applicative or the end result. Uh, so. 
but we, we could uh, we could just flip those two uh, without changing anything uh, with the with the applicative implementation. Um, so uh, in the in the next section, we're going to to see how we can actually uh, leverage the lift A two without a monad instance and run those uh, those effects actually independently, not on, not only uh, virtually. But uh, first, so I talked about syntactic sugar, and in uh, well. One benefit you gain from, from monads is actually in Haskell the do notation, which is uh, an abstract notation for sequencing effects. It looks like uh, looks a lot like uh, imperative programming. You execute statements one, of the, the, one after the other, and that's, that's as, it, uh, as you can see here, it's much more readable than the d sugar version with the, with the bind operator. And you don't have that do notation. Uh, for applicatives, so you lose some uh, some expressivity. But well, you used you didn't used to have, but now you do. There's the applicative do uh, extension to the uh, to the Haskell language, at least in GHC, <laughs> um, where you can use uh, where you can actually desugar uh, do notation also to an applicative. Now I'm going to use that later because it really makes uh, code much more readable. So, um, if I re-implement lift a two in my own terms, then uh, then I just would use the uh, the, the monad abstraction, uh, the do notation, and it would be desugared to that what we just saw. And you can notice that even though I'm only using uh, applicatives here, it, the type is inferred to a monad constraint because that's what do notation needs. And with applicative do, I actually can re-implement the uh, my lift a two, and it well it will get an applicative constraint, and you uh, so so even the the compiler will use the uh, the actual lift a two the applicative lift a two implementation for um, for the implementation of my lift a two for desugaring do notation, and that. Works also for for functors. So if, if you don't have any effects to combine, then it will even infer the um, uh, the do notation to uh, to a functor constraint. And if you're mixing applicative and monadic operations, then the applicative do will actually try to use applicatives where possible and monads only where it's actually required. There are some libraries who uh, that that actually make use of this. Uh, for example, the Facebook's Haxel library, which is a data fetching uh, uh, library, and it allows to uh, to run applicative effects in parallel and uh, monadic effects sequentially. And the, with the applicative do, uh, you can run everything that's parallel. Uh, so the compiler will already notice what operations are parallelizable and which ones are have interdependencies and have to be run sequentially. <clears throat> so that already brings me to the to the next topic: um, how to leverage applicative. So we are we all usually we usually we we use um, monads for designing DSLs, and we just do it by default because that's uh, that's what lots of tutorials tell tell us. Um, but so this this. Um, the, the monadic structure gives us some limitations that applicatives don't have. For example, uh, the first uh, library is, uh, is the async library, uh, the Haskell library async, um, and it has a concurrently type. Now, the co concurrently is just a wrapper around I/O, so uh, you have you have a run concurrently that directly can execute the I/O or interpret the I/O actions. Uh, but the functor and applicative um, implement, uh, yeah, functor, uh, uh, sorry, the applicative and the alternative uh, implementations actually take care of parallelizing. So you can use this, for example, for fetching two different data sets, um, and you do that concurrently in parallel, and then you can uh, 
use this data to fill in some uh, some uh, some domain object. And actually, it's not possible or not not sensible to write a monad instance for concurrently, because if you again look at the implementation for lift A2, if you write it in terms of uh, of a monadic bind, then you see you have to execute the effects one after the other. So there is actually no parallelization, no concurrency. But the applicative structure allows you to actually run those two in parallel because you don't have to uh, to fall back to this kind of sequencing. <clears throat> so, well, the only way to, to write a monad instance is one that's kind of almost uh, breaking the laws, almost because the uh, the uh, uh, the results are still the same, but uh, it's an observable difference uh, whether the uh, computations are parallel or sequential. <clears throat> the next example is uh, applicative parser, and um, there's a there's a, a correspondence between monadic parsers and context-sensitive languages, and applicative parsers and context-free languages. So the Chomsky hierarchy of, uh, of uh, uh, context and languages um, uh, it has some mapping to the uh, applicative and monad hierarchy. Uh, and most languages you actually encounter in the wild are uh, context-free languages. There are only a few examples of context-sensitive languages that are actually used, like, like uh, XML, for example, is actually a context-sensitive language. But uh, markup languages like JSON, uh, yes? I'm sorry. Uh, yeah? I think uh, the parser is context-free, whereas the language and the semantics are completely different stories, right? They, uh, the but parser the, the, can yeah. protect the context-free language. If you use pass generator or uh, any yes. of but the language, the, the, yeah. the, the, the semantic model behind the parser mm -hmm. can do anything. Um, well, uh, in a, for uh, with parser combinator libraries, you uh, that's a different story uh, uh, yes. than uh, than parser generators. Of course, the parser generator can do anything internally. Well, uh, parser combinator. Uh, so you, you can cannot parse a context sensitive language just using a uh, a applicative combinator library. You need you, you need to use some some extra um, at least not at least not with a finite grammar. So you can use an infinite applicative grammar to parse a context sensitive language, but that's not. I'm just pointing out the context yeah. freeness is mm -hmm. a, a property of the parser, not the language. That's yes. Important. Okay. Yeah. <clears throat> okay. Um, but yes. So uh, actually, an applicative parser is what you need most of the times. Um, most parser combinator libraries, like Parsec, Attaparsec, uh, um, Trifecta, and so on, they are monadic parsers. But that's actually for for most for most cases that's overkill, and you can. Uh, on the other hand, leverage uh, the, the applicative structure of the parser to uh, gain some insights uh, on the language that you wouldn't get with a monadic parser. One example for this is the opparse applicative library, um, which is a command line option parser. <clears throat> and so with opparse applicative, you, uh, you define first your, uh, your set of uh, Command line, uh, command line parameters. For example, you ha can have a verbose flag, which is a boolean. Either you have verbose mode on or not. You have the uh, the config option, which takes a maybe a file. So if you don't have an external config, then you, you just give nothing. And you, if you want to use a special config, then uh, you give a just string. And then this uh, example application will take a positional parameter, which is a file name to operate on. And we, uh, we uh, write this parser. Um, so we have one parser for the, uh, for the verbose flag, which is a, a switch. And we tell it to, to be a, have a short option V, so you can use minus V, 
or you can use minus minus verbose as a long flag. And we do the same thing for the for the config parameter, which is an optional parameter. You can uh, use it, you can specify it or not. And it's a string option also with a minus minus config or a minus C. And then we have the uh, the file, which is a string argument, uh, and it's a positional argument, so you don't specify a flag before that. And Together with that, with, uh, we use this parser with a main function that just parses the command line and prints the, the resulting args. Now we can see, uh, we, can, we can have a look at the results. So if I just use a positional parameter, then I get the, the args with no verbose flag and no config, and the file is foo.txt. And I can specify the verbose flag and get verbose equals true. Or I can specify an external config file. So that's just, etc. my config. And now I do something wrong. <clears throat> I specify two files. And now the parser can give me uh, the, in, uh, an entire help file. So I, I didn't. I didn't have, uh, I didn't specify any of this, uh, this text in the code. Although I, well, I specified this, this config file meta var and the input file meta var and the string and the, and the help string. But those were uh, specified in the parser. And now the parser can, when it fails, generate uh, examples or a help text that, um, that tells me how to use this application. And you couldn't do this with a monadic parser because a monadic parser needs the result of a previous uh, of a, needs a previous parse result uh, in order to run the next parser stage. So you couldn't run it in reverse to uh, to generate examples with an applicative parser. Since you have you you don't have uh, any dependent structure, you can um, <coughs> you can run the parser kind of in reverse and, uh, and generate uh, a valid grammar. So that's also one thing you can, uh, or the, the canonical example of what you can do with an applicative parser is generate the BNF for the language that you're parsing. <clears throat> now, um, moving on to the third example is uh, the validation, validation type. Validation looks a lot like uh, a lot like either. In fact, it's well, it's congruent. It's uh, the, the same. It has exactly the same uh, structure as a data type. Um, you have a left value or failure and a right value for success, and you can your your data type can be either the uh, one or the other. <coughs> Usually, you use left to encode failures and rights to encode success. Um, but uh, those two differ in their applicative instances. The, uh, the applicative instance for either will just abort if, uh, the, if the first argument is left. So it, as soon as you encounter a failure, you will abort and keep the failure around. Uh, and you, you won't do any more, uh, any more computations. Uh, the, uh, the, the validation applicative instance is a bit, more, a bit more tricky. It will, even if it encounters a failure, it will still run the, the other computations as well. And if another computation fails as well, then it will aggregate the failures. So um, you, you, don't just, uh, you don't just abort, you, uh, you run the computation until you have all the failures accumulated. And so, that's why we need another constraint here. We need a way to combine failures. And then we can check for two failures in two operations and combine, uh, and combine the results. Or if only one of those two fails, then we return, of course, only the one failure. And if we, if we have two successes, then, uh, then we can actually continue with the, uh, the computation and apply the, uh, the combinator f the combining function f. And 
Well, why is either implemented that way? Because we have a monad instance, and the, the monad instance um, needs us to evaluate the, the argument first, and then apply the, uh, the, the function f, the, the continuation for, uh, for the next action. <clears throat> so there is no way in, uh, if, if we derive um, the, uh, if, if we derive uh, either from a monad, there is no way to look at two uh, computations independently and run them both and then combine results. For validation, on the other hand, a monad instance that's compatible with uh, this applicative instance is simply not possible. But we gain the the extra um, the extra power to to list all the errors that we encounter and not only the first one. And so that's that's very useful if you, for example, have uh, some uh, you have some input. Uh, you have a, a, for example, a, a web service request we, you want to wa validate, and uh, you want to point out all the errors. You don't want to uh, the, the client to, to play uh, ping pong to try a request, then you point out, hey, there's an error. Okay, I fixed, uh, I fixed this error. Oh, there's, a, uh, there's another error in the, in the next part. Okay, you fix this. Oh, there's a third error. But you can, uh, you can actually have uh, tell the tell the client all the errors that were in this uh, in, the, in the request at once. So that's very useful. <clears throat> um, yeah. And, well, here's an example. So uh, you use the lift a two function to to lift the constructor over two validated uh, results, and <clears throat> and you get back a list of errors that uh, that you can. Uh, so either you get back a successful result or a list of errors that point out whether the first name is uh, valid and the last name or where errors were. <clears throat> okay, <clears throat> and actually, uh, so uh, all of this, uh, in, in particular this validation type, uh, although I'm, I'm presenting this in Haskell now, you can use it in basically uh, any language that, uh, uh, that allows Lambda functions. So uh, the, the project I'm currently working on is, is written in Java. It's a big data application uh, in Java and a tiny bit of Scala. Uh, but we have actually have this kind of validation type. It works in Java as well, and we use it in order to to validate records uh, that um, that may uh, may have uh, an entirely wrong structure or maybe some, only some fields are invalid, and we want to count all the invalid fields and not, the, not just abort at the first invalid field. So that's, uh, that's a very useful structure for, for validating larger, uh, larger, rec larger records. <clears throat> yes, and one more benefit we get from, uh, from applicatives is uh, free composition. So, if you have a monadic language, then usually you uh, you have monad transformers that uh, you have a uh, uh, well. If you if you have a monadic language and you want to combine effects of different monads, then you usually have a transformer stack. That uh, so you have to with a monad you have to specify how side effects of you know, different uh, different items in the stack interact. Um, for applicatives, this is easier because looking at this compose type, which just uh, composes a functor f or applicative f, a uh, uh, functor of or applicative g, um, by wrapping the the inner one and the outer one, <clears throat> we can, actually for for this type we can directly derive an instance for functor. If both are functors, and for applicative, if both are applicative, so the composition of two functors is a, a, again a functor, and the composition of two applicatives is again a, an applicative. This does not hold for monads. <clears throat> um, and you can actually so, of course, since every monad is also an applicative, you can actually use this 
composition also to combine two monads, you just are a bit more restricted because you can't use any monadic features uh, anymore of those, uh, of those two types you're combining. But for example, um, if, you, if you want to combine a parser with a writer for logging, for example, so uh, you, can, you can use this writer to, to, uh, to tell the, to, for, for debugging, to tell, uh, to tell which rules have triggered or which rules have failed. Um, and you can do this with an, with, uh, an, an applicative stack Although the, the writer is, uh, has a monad instance and the parser may be a monadic parser, you lose the monadic features of the, of the combined parser, but you gain uh, directly. So you can just, you, you just run those two uh, sequentially, but you can use the results of the, of the any token parser uh, from the parser library and feed it to the, to the inner uh, well, uh, yeah, to the to the inner uh, type to the to the writer effect, and tell the writer what token you found. <clears throat> so that's free com uh, uh, free composition without using any transform uh, any mono transformer libraries, uh, and you can do this in a very generic way, so, uh, such that. Um, uh, yeah, well, you, you don't need to look at the specific effects of, uh, for example, of reader and writer. You just can compose uh, those two generically. Well, um, so we've talked about some existing libraries that, uh, that leverage this uh, effect. I have uh, actually used um, the, the concept of, uh, the, of applicatives to, uh, to create a, a small uh, DSL for, for my project, um, which is, as I said, a big data application, and we use a lot of unbounded streaming there. And testing unbounded streaming is kind of a hard job because you, you have no notion of stream consumption, so you don't uh, inject test data, wait until everything is processed, and then verify the data because there is no notion of everything is processed. Um, and we came around this, um, this problem by uh, by using continuous system tests. So we just deploy a, a small application that's a test data generator, and that pushes test data every minute. And on uh, on the other end of the pipeline, we have a, a test data sync that pulls uh, data regularly and verifies that there is a certain amount of data per time. And uh, so in order to, uh, and we have lots of those test data generators, and in order to not write one generator for every use case, uh, I designed a small DSL, which uh, should be, well, it should be um, self-documenting uh, self and easy to read, it should be extensible, so if you have a new data type you want to add uh, you want to add combinators for the, for the new data types, and it should be parsable from a config file. So you don't want to change the test data generator application uh, for changing the DSL, you just want to, uh, to change a config file. You want to deploy one application at, for many data streams that have different, uh, uh, different data types. And I actually used uh, the uh, applicative DSLs here. So <clears throat> for, for generating a, a random anything, random numbers, random strings, whatever, uh, we have the random generator uh, interface in, uh, or type class in, in Haskell. And <clears throat> we can write a functor and an applicative instance. The applicative works uh, by splitting the random number generator and feeding it to, uh, to both um, to, to the both uh, sub-effects. Um, and this way you, uh, you get very stable results. So if you have one seed, the, the results are uh, reproducible, even if you change some of the computational structure um, by, for example, if you add uh, another field, then all the other fields are still uh, stable if you use the same random number, uh, random number generator seed. 
So that's different from, uh, from for example, arbitrary in, uh, in, uh, in QuickCheck, which is what was kind of the inspiration for this. But uh, the arbitrary uh, type class uses uh, a lot of generator state that's carried around. And uh, so although the, the examples of, uh, no, of QuickCheck are reproducible if you, if you just run them again with the same seed, they are not reproducible if you change anything to the, to the uh, structure of the test data generation. And that's different here. <clears throat> and from, uh, from, this, from this basic DSL, you can immediately write some, some combinators. So uh, the, the easiest one is the constant combinator that always gives you back the same non-random value. Or you can uh, use bounded uh, <coughs> bounded values that uh, that have a that are drawn from a range, and one particularly uh, useful thing is the choose um, combinator that allows you to to combine uh, to to draw a, a random generator from from a set of generators and then draw a value from that generator. So you can uh, also generate uh, non-homogeneous uh, uh, data and of course the the pick which is just derived from the choose uh, pick a value from a list of items <clears throat> and then from from those basic combinators you can uh, build more complex domain combinators for example uh, drawing from uh, for uh, drawing values for a maybe value you uh, choose just bet uh, between generating something or nothing, or either you, do, you choose between generating a left value or a right value. And well, uh, for, particularly for, for our um, application, we have uh, this, uh, so we use actually CSV records throughout most of the system. And uh, so we have just a list of column generators and sequence them together to uh, to generate that generates a uh, generates a CSV record. And this DSL is uh, used either as an embedded DSL. So, for example, to generate a person, you draw a random name and a random age, and then you can uh, just put them together. That's uh, the applicative do extension. So. Uh, in Java, for example, you would need to uh, to actually use lift a2, but that's basically the, the lift a2 and um, with applicative with the applicative do extension. Um, and well, what we use we use an uh, we use a YAML parser, and so the same the same generation uh, can also be be done in a, in a YAML file. We use uh, YAML type annotations for uh, for constructors and for um, uh, for the the generator function to use, and then you all, uh, even have named arguments for specifying for, for configuring the generators. So the uh, H has actually min and max uh, names, so it's it's really really readable. It's easy to uh, easy to adapt and. Um, yeah, well, uh, there is there is one application we deploy, and we have lots of config files that can easily be changed and adapted to to new data flows. <clears throat> so, this is the end of my talk. I don't know whether we have any time left for questions. We do. Okay. <laughs> Started a bit later, so we can take your time. Yeah. Or do you want to choose? Who? Yeah, sure. Yes. Uh, I just got lost on your slide. A look more on old transformers. Yes. Maybe you can repeat a little bit what mm -hmm. it was about. I just didn't get it. Uh, <coughs> what it was supposed to show. So, um, are you are you familiar with the concept concept of a mono transformer? Yeah. Yes. Um, so a modern transformer, for example, the um, reader T. Yeah. Reader T is uh, is uh, something that uh, that 
puts the reader effect on top of some other effects. And the reader T specifies how to, um, how to uh, combine the, the side effect of a reader, uh, so reading from, uh, taking a value from an environment with some other <coughs> side effect that's in the stack below. Um, and you have to do this, since monads don't, uh, don't uh, generally compose, you have to do this for every side effect uh, separately. So you have a reader transformer, you have a writer transformer, you have a parser transformer, and so on. And with applicatives, uh, this is much easier because they actually do compose generally. So you have this compose type you can use, and you can, you can combine any two effects regardless of uh, whether they are readers, writers, uh, parsers, whatever. Um, and you don't need to, to write a writer transformer for this, or a parser transformer to, to uh, combine those two effects. But on the other hand, you lose the monadic structure. Did this kind of answer your question? Um. Yeah, yeah, I, I guess I understand the concept. Uh, I just have trouble with the implementation, but I okay. uh, just have to look at it. Yeah. We can also talk about this uh, after afterwards, if you like. <coughs> yes. When you're using this validation type, yeah. um, did you have the possibility to validate concurrently? I don't know if that's desirable, but is that? It's certainly you possible, yes. So it, it, Basically, just as in the implementation of the uh, of the uh, <coughs> applicative instance, if you if you would run those two uh, concurrently, then uh, so you, of course you do, you would need some wrapper to do parallel I/O. But in, in principle, if you if you're able to to evaluate those two uh, in parallel, then you can do parallel validation. Yes. Can you compose this with like the concurrently from async maybe? Certainly, yes. Or maybe probably, yes, yes, certainly. Yeah. And that gives you the composition. I mean, that, that's yeah. completely separate, but you can compose them and then you get both. That's right, yes. Effects. Yes. And, that's nice. <coughs> and also, you should use non empty lists and semi groups instead of monoids. Otherwise, you get <laughs> probably, yes. empty probably. elements on the, mm -hmm. on the results. Yeah. Right. <coughs> Are there any more questions? Um, can you tell me the use case in of application TSL uh, with the distributed computing framework like Kafka and Spark? Hmm. I actually haven't given this any thought yet. Yeah, mm -hmm. because what I felt is this composition and abstraction is good at uh, theory, but when we want to really implement in something like this framework, where uh, performance is a uh, key. Pardon? I mean, say I mean to say the performance is a key over mm -hmm. there. So mm -hmm. how to take uh, advantage of appli applicative TSL over there? <coughs> I'm I'm not sure. I, I actually understand the question. So, um, so sorry. Can can you can you? I'm saying sorry. that if I want to use the applicative mm -hmm. DSL implementation. Mm -hmm. On distributed computing yeah. frameworks like Spark, yeah. how can I start with that? How can you start with that? So, uh, you uh, if you if you want to to use an uh, use power of applicatives, then you have to uh, to to think about what you what you gain uh, from not having a monad instance. For example, of, for distributed systems, I could think of. Um, that if you use a monad, then uh, then you can uh, run. Th then you are able to, to do things sequentially by uh, by distributing some computation, gathering those results, distributing another computation. So um, you don't have much parallelism. So it's kind of similar to the concurrently case. Um, if you have an implicative DSL, then you you are upfront. You have the the upfront guarantee. That you only run uh, so distribute and gather results once and not uh, and not many times one after the other. Okay, got it. Thank you. Mm. 
So. Right. Another round of applause for Hans. Yeah. The slides for this talk are on GitHub. And uh, also, there's the, the two main papers I did use. Uh, that's applicative programming with effects from 2008. That's, I think, the, the paper where uh, applicatives were actually invented. And this is uh, by the, the author of the Opcurse Applicative uh, Library, uh, which talks about the, the, uh, the, the, the how to leverage applicatives over monads. 